I'm very pleased that uh, Maddie is going to give us this talk. She is a uh, University of Maryland Extension Agent Associate for Horticulture and also a Master Gardener Coordinator for Howard County here in Maryland. The overall focus of her extension program is educating others on sustainable horticulture, particularly as it pertains to sustainable pest management, conservation of beneficial arthropods, and management of invasive species. She received her Bachelor of Science in Environmental Horticulture, a minor in sustainability, and a high honor certification in entomology from the University of Maryland College Park. This past spring, she successfully defended her master's thesis and received an MS in entomology from College Park. She has been conducting research in the field of sustainable insect pest management and beneficial insect conservation for the past five years her master's research was on biological control of the invasive brown marmorated stink bug, which we all love to hate, and included a community science project. Tonight, uh, Madeline Potter will discuss the results of her master's research, including lessons from a Maryland insect egg hunt that was funded partially from a Maryland Native Plant Society research grant. Thank you very much, Maddie, and take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Judy, for that warm introduction and welcome. Good evening, everyone. If I haven't met you before, my name is Maddie. I just want to give a quick shout out to any uh, Maryland Master Gardeners that might be in the audience tonight. So tonight I'm presenting Lessons from an Insect Egg Hunt, How Plant Selection Can Impact Sustainable Control of Insect Pests. And as we can see with this first slide, um, within the little circles over on our right are various insect eggs. Um, some are egg masses, which means individual eggs clustered together. Um, and we can begin to see the vast diversity of insect eggs. So we might know that vast diversity of adult insects, but their eggs are just as diverse. Um, so we'll return to that um, idea and these images a little bit later in the presentation, but just a little introduction as we begin. So since I am a part of University of Maryland Extension um, and we get federal funding uh, with any of our programs such as uh, tonight's presentation, uh, we always show this and justice for all poster and our equity statement. And this just lets all of our participants know that um, if for any reason you feel that a program isn't accessible to you, it means you can reach out to us directly or through the USDA um, and their contact information is on this Injustice for All poster. And there's also a link on the bottom right of your screen here too. Um, a little bit, at, I'll, I'll wait till the end of the presentation. We also like to put out the option for you all to fill out an anonymous um, self-identification poll. This just helps us collect data to know who we're reaching in Maryland because we wanna make sure we're reaching new and diverse audiences because we have a such diverse of a, st of a state. Okay, so a little overview of what we'll talk about today. I'll start with an introduction of about insects. We'll get into the insect egg hunt research that was a part of my master's research. And then we'll dive in there to the methods, the results, and then we'll get into conclusions and implications on sustainable pest control. So our story begins with insects. Um, and I'm curious to know if, if we were in person, I do a little hand raise of, or um, thumbs up, thumbs in the middle, thumbs down of how you feel about insects. And I'm sure it depends on the situation. It depends on the insect. Um, but I'm here to do a little bit of an introduction and to hopefully sway you toward the positive a bit more. And so insects make up 80% of all life 
on earth. So they definitely outnumber um, us as humans and other animals. Um, we can think about tiny insects like our ants or even smaller insects that we, we need a microscope to see, um, but they make up a huge part of all the life that we have here on this planet. When we're talking about diversity, so far, we have discovered approximately 1 million insect species. We predict that there are at least 4 million more species that we haven't discovered yet. And I love to tell people this because it goes to show that this is a field that we need more people in. Entomology, the science of studying insects to discover more and to learn more from these insects and how they play a part within our ecosystems, their relationships with our plants. So insects have various roles within our ecosystems. This is just a few of the positive roles, we can name them positive, that they provide for us as pollinators, decomposers, pest controllers, and even sources of food, not only for humans, but for our fellow animals and wildlife. Now, we can broadly categorize insects into um, one of two categories. Again, this is just a very broad um, categorization, but we referenced earlier our beneficial insects. So those are things like our pollinators or maybe our insects that help to feed on our pest insects. Um, but that other group are our pest insects. So these are insects that um, cause us harm in some way. Um, with our official definition here, um, an insect whose biology, behavior, or location places it in direct conflict with humans. So we might be familiar with a weed as simply a plant out of place. Um, we could have a similar attitude toward our pests. So it really depends on say, a pest that feeds on plants in small numbers might not be considered a pest because it's providing food for other animals, um, but a insect that feeds on our plants, so herbivorous insect in high numbers would be causing more damage um, than we might be calling it a pest at that point. But the good news is, is approximately one to three percent of insect species are considered pests. So that's excellent news. That means all the rest of our species are providing us with some sort of ecosystem service. And so getting toward my research, uh, my story started with a particular key pest, and that is the invasive brown marmorated stink bug, also known as BMSB. Some of us might be familiar with this pest. It was in really high numbers um, a couple years ago, especially this time of year. These insects like to come into um, buildings or homes to overwinter in, so we may have had a huge infestation of them um, in the fall and through the winter time. And so the brown marmorite stink bug with the scientific name Haliomorpha house is an invasive pest from Northeast Asia. It was first detected in the U.S. in Pennsylvania in the mid-1990s and has since spread to 46 U.S. states. It has a very broad host range. It is not a picky eater. It has over, over 200 different host plants that it can feed from. In Maryland, it has two generations per year, one in June and one in late July. So we'll move over to our images on the right of the screen. On the top left, we can see I'm holding on to a leaf and on the bottom of that leaf is a BMSB egg mass. So um, the mother BMSB lays individual barrel shaped eggs. And so each one of these little barrels or circles you can see here is an individual egg and she'll glue them together in what's called an insect egg mass. Um, and so typically with BMSB, we find they lay their eggs in our egg masses in 28s. So there's 28 eggs to a typical egg mass. They're usually this bluish mint green color when they're first laid and they'll begin to um, turn color as they develop. And then the photo on the bottom is these hatched baby BMSB. We call these nymphs. And so we can see the stink bug nymphs. There's a, they're a start off as this black orange color. 
They typically stick around their egg mass until they get a little bit bigger. And then as they develop, they'll be go through several stages or molts. And then on our right, we can see an adult BMSB. Now, there are lots of different brown colored stink bug species out there. And so this one, um, how would we differentiate BMSB from other native stink bugs that might look similar? So the first trait is these two white bands in either antenna. The next trait is we look toward the shoulders of our stink bug right behind the head. We call this the pronotum um, and their shoulders are smooth versus one of our native brown stink bugs has toothed or ridged shoulders. And then our last trait is if we look toward um, the bottom of our insect, we can see alternating dark and light bands. So a combination of spotting these three traits on a stink bug, this typical mottled brown gray coloration is a good indicator that it is BMSB or Halimorpha house. And this is the type of damage that BMSB can cause. It has what's called a piercing sucking mouth part. So it's a straw like proboscis, sometimes called a rostrum. And it will use its proboscis to pierce plant tissue. And it typically causes this bruising. Sometimes it's called cat facing damage. And it feeds on all different types of fruit, nut, um, and vegetable crops, as well as ornamental plants. So these are just a couple of examples of some pretty prominent signs of BMSB feeding and damage. So we have our key pests. And we need to find a way to sustainably control this pest. As it first came to the U.S., a lot of people were using pesticides to try to combat their high populations, which we should know is not sustainable. When we're spraying chemicals, it tends to harm our beneficial insects as well. And so I sought out with my research some way to sustainably control this invasive BMSB pest. And with previous research um, on what we know on a lot of stink bug pests is biological control is a great way um, to lower their populations. Now, biological control is the use of predators, parasitoids, and or pathogens, which are called natural enemies. So enemies of our pests that naturally occur within our environment to suppress pest populations below damaging levels. So lowering those pest populations. And so I focused on our parasitoids. Now, what are parasitoids? Uh, parasitoids can come from different insect groups, including wasps, beetles, and flies. Um, but the parasitoids of stink bugs tend to be wasps in the order Hymenoptera. And these are what I like to call our unsung heroes within our ecosystems. They're a very important source of biological control. They attack all different types of insect pests. They do not sting humans. They're only targeting their hosts. Um, there can be endo or ecto parasitoids. That means they're either developing on the outside or the inside of their host. And scientists estimate that there's a parasitic wasp for almost every pest insect out there. So that's pretty crazy. These parasitic wasps tend to be smaller in size and they are very sensitive to insecticides, just like our pollinators. And they also love nectar, something they also share with pollinators. So the recommendations we tend to give people to support pollinators, building up these pollinator gardens, also support our parasitic wasps, which is really awesome. So the parasitic wasps that attack BMSB, our key invasive pests we're talking about tonight, um, they are endoparasitoids. They develop on the inside of their host and they attack the egg stage of stink bugs. So we can see the video playing on our right here is one that I took under magnification underneath a microscope in my lab. And we can see one of these parasitic wasps on top of a stink bug egg mass. And this female parasitic wasp is feeling out this um, egg mass to see if it's viable, to see if it's worth laying her eggs in. And she's sensing it with her antenna and her feet. And what she's gonna do when she finds a suitable egg is she's going to put her abdomen up against the egg, 
She'll have her egg laying appendage come out with, which is called an ovipositor. She'll insert it into the egg and she'll lay her egg inside of a stink bug egg. So she'll lay one egg, the egg will eventually hatch. It'll be a larval wasp that comes out and it will feed on the stink bug baby or nymph that was originally inside that egg. That wasp will begin to develop. And once it reaches its adult form, it will chew its way out of the egg and emerge out as another, another parasitic wasp. Might sound gruesome, it's great for Halloween tonight, but it's really cool and a really awesome source of sustainable pest control where we are not using pesticides. These parasitoids can either be specialists or generalists, and we'll go ahead and talk about what that means next. Oh, and this is to show how small these particular parasitic wasps are. So this, that black dot, you can barely see in the center of my palm is how small this parasitic wasp is. So they're really small. So generalist parasitic wasps can parasitize more than one group of insects. And we're talking about parasitizing, we're talking about laying eggs inside of their hosts. Um, so, one parasitoid, this particular species we're going to be talking about, Anastatus reduvii, can parasitize insects from um, orders like Hemiptera, our true bugs, like our stink bugs. They can parasitize insects like Lepidopterans, our moths, skippers, and butterflies. And they can also parasitize mantids in their egg sacs. And then there's some specialist parasitic wasps, which only attack one group of insects, or they can even be as specialized as only attacking one type of species of insect. Um, so there's a mixture of both that attack stink bugs. Some are specialized to stink bugs, some um, attack more than just stink bug eggs. And so, so far we know that there are four BMSB parasitoid species that are known as generalists and seven BMSB parasitoid species that are specialists. So they only attack stink bug eggs. And so here's a table of those particular BMSB parasitoid species um, that are found in North America. All of these are native to North America, except for our Trisulcus japonicus. You may have heard this um, known as samurai wasp when we were at the height of having BMSB in our area. And so along the top, we have different genera of these parasitic wasps. We have four main genera here and underneath are the species that are listed out. Highlighted in green, so the generas of Anastatus and O. incertus are generalists. So they attack more than just stink bug eggs. And then over on our right, highlighted in yellow, we have stink bug specialists. So Telenomus and Trisulcus. Now, out of all these different species, one has really stood out from previous research before I started my research, and that is Anastatus reduvii. We can see a picture of Anastatus here. It tends to look like an ant. It's about the size of an ant, if not a little bit smaller, but it has a pair of wings and it has this distinctive white band in the wings where the rest of its wing, it tends to be dark gray or black. So what's special about Anastatus reduvii? It is native to North America. In, in previous research, it is found to be the most successful U.S. native parasitoid of BMSB in nursery studies. So they looked at all the different parasitoids that were attacking BMSB in specifically nursery settings. And this one was the most successful at parasitizing, laying its eggs inside of stink bug eggs. It is a generalist, so it, it parasitizes eggs across at least four or more orders. We're going to learn more about that later. It's arboreal, so it tends to prefer habitats with trees, but its life history is relatively unknown. And so once I found this out, I knew we had to learn more about Anastatus reduvii's biology and ecology. So over on the right, we can see an image. The top one is underneath a microscope because this insect is so small. Its body is metallic colored and we can just see that distinct white band in the wings. So the top one is a female and then the bottom one is a male. And you can see how small it is on top of my pointer fingernail, um, how small it is. It needs to be small to be able to fit inside of a stink bug egg. 
And so we're developing our story here. We have our key pest, BMSB. Now we have our key natural enemy, our parasitic wasp, Anastatus reduvii. And we have these questions. We don't know a lot about its biology or ecology. And if we want to learn how to um, support these parasitic wasps to lower BMSB populations, we need to learn more about what it needs to survive in our ecosystems. And so this goes into the concept of ways we can boost biological control programs, boost those beneficial insects, the ones that are helping to sustainably control our pests. And the information that we need to support biological control programs include natural enemy prey slash host range. So knowing what hosts and prey they need to survive, natural enemy habitat, knowing which different plants and habitat types best support them. And once we have this information, we can utilize it to manipulate habitats to favor conservation of natural enemies, or we can utilize it to select habitats that may be more optimal for releases. So we may have heard of purchasing ladybird beetles or ladybugs or lacewings to release within our landscape to provide that biological control. So with more information, we know the ideal places to release these natural enemies. So the overall goal of my master's research was to enhance biological control of BMSB and other stink bugs through supporting the success of Anastatus reduvii and related egg parasitoids. And my objectives were to first identify overwintering and in-season hosts of parasitoid species. Second, to assess what host plant species and habitat types are associated with parasitoid species. And then three, to elucidate which factors are important to egg unit discovery and to parasitism rate. So that's a mouthful. I'll break all of these down. But I want you to be aware that even though we're talking about a specific study system with our key pests of BMSB and this key parasitic wasp Anastatus reduvii, that what we'll learn from this research can apply to other insect pests and other insect natural enemies. And so why are these things important? Why is it important to learn about host range, um, preferred plants and habitat types? Um, and I'll demonstrate this by briefly talking about what we know about the life cycle of Anastatus. So this is the genus of that star parasitoid we wanna learn more about, Anastatus reduvii. So in the springtime, Anastatus reduvii emerges out of her overwintering egg host. Merges out as adults. Remember, she's chewing a little hole out of the top of that egg, flying out that tiny little parasitoid. She's going out into the landscape. When she goes out into the landscape, she's going to look for nectar resources. So this is her main form of food and energy. So she's flying out into the landscape. And we want to learn more about how she or what plants she prefers to visit and go to. Um, and then once she reaches those plants, does she find her host? And what host does she prefer to lay her eggs in? So remembering this particular wasp, its hosts are egg stages of different insect species. So in the summertime, she's looking for nectar sources. She's looking for insect eggs to lay her eggs in. And then come autumn, she's going to be looking for eggs to overwinter inside. So at this point of the cycle in the autumn, she's searching for insect egg hosts where this particular insect overwinters in its egg stage as well. So we're talking about insects that are such as mantids that overwinter in its egg or wheel bug eggs. And since this particular insect stays in that egg form, she'll parasitize or lay her eggs inside of there and her young will remain inside those overwintering eggs until spring to start that cycle over again. So we wanted to learn what are these overwintering insect eggs that she's choosing to parasitize? And with all this information, we'll learn more about parasitic wasp biology and ecology, and this will inform our biological control programs and recommendations to environmental stewards like you all. So here comes the research part. This gets into the fun insect egg hunt. Um, and part of this research was collecting insect eggs, collecting any and all insect eggs throughout Maryland. 
Then with these insect eggs, we would rear them um, in growth chambers. So any insects inside, we would discover what was inside of them. And then we would identify the eggs and what emerges and related data. So getting into the methods of this research, first is egg sampling, rearing, and identification. And so this was a two-year study that began in 2020. Um, and in 2020, we collected eggs from a tree nursery site in Adamstown, Maryland, where we did repeated tree sampling from July through September. Then in 2021, we did an egg survey study. This included a community science project with 50 volunteers throughout Maryland. And this included random plant and egg surveys from March through September. And so for our tree nursery study in 2020, we did standardized visual sampling where we collected all eggs that we found from these trees. We had nine different sampling dates and we had five tree species where we collected, um, we collected from 10 trees per species, so 50 trees total. And you can see the list of the different tree species that we took a look at, including red maple, sugar maple, white oak, scarlet oak, and red oak. And these were all organically grown in this particular nursery. Then for our egg survey study in 2021, this was the community science project um, where we had 50 Maryland master gardeners helping us to collect insect eggs. Um, they searched all throughout Maryland, um, a total of nine different Maryland counties from March to September 2021. And the different habitats that these master gardeners were able to search included agricultural, urban herbaceous, urban vegetable gardens, urban woody, and wood slash wooded edges. And over on our right, um, I created a little stamp logo that we put on our shipping boxes. Uh, we called this project Stink Be Gone 2, 2 because I had a predecessor in my lab that ran a similar community science project to learn more about stink bug parasitoids. So this was the second rendition. Um, and then all of the materials um, below are what we sent each community scientist or master gardener. So we sent them petri dishes to put the insect eggs in, data sheets. Um, we had a cooler to preserve those eggs through shipment um, and then shipping labels in the shipping box itself. So again, um, a little summary, we have our key pests, BMSB. We have our key natural enemy we want to learn more about, Anastatus reduvii. We have these key questions, insect egg host range, the overwintering insect egg host, preferred habitat, associated host plants. And um, our valuable community scientists helping us to collect more data throughout different parts of Maryland. And so here are some of the different insect eggs that um, myself and the community scientists were able to collect. And I had a lot of fun looking at these underneath a microscope. Uh, the insect eggs are just as diverse as insect adults or the active stages. Um, we can see all different sorts of insect eggs. We can see um, with this one, uh, the actual larva inside of those eggs, since these eggs are a little more translucent. On our top right, these look like gumdrops. This is some type of moth egg mass. Um, and so these are really cool to discover within the landscape. I like to call to tell the, my community scientists that it's called gaining the sight when you begin to notice insects and insect eggs throughout the landscape. They tend to be hiding, but once we get um, good at spotting these things, usually looking at a leaf through sunlight, we can begin to see um, these creatures and this whole community come to life before our eyes. And so these community scientists were going out and they were collecting data on not only collecting that physical insect egg they found, but what the host plant was they found it on, the habitat it was in, date of collection, and even down to GPS coordinates. And so down on the bottom here is a sample of what their data sheet looked like all the different um, variables that they collected. And up on the top right is, is, is an example of their Petri dish, um, a little leaf cut out with a stink bug egg mass in it. Um, and you can see the top of the Petri dish, we also had them fill out specific data so we could keep track of everything. And so the community scientists would record all of this data. They would put all their 
individual insect eggs in their labeled petri dishes and they would ship them to me at the Shrewsbury Insect Lab at University of Maryland College Park. We would place these eggs inside of growth chambers. Those are basically like big refrigerators where we can control the temperature, the humidity, and the light and dark cycles. So we set it to um, a specific parameter to mimic outdoor conditions so we can begin to rear out whatever insects are developing inside those eggs, hopefully finding some parasitic wasps. And with this, we would identify the insect eggs themselves and then anything that would emerge out of these insect eggs. Everything was labeled to keep track of it. And we would check for emergence every one to six days, thanks to me and my lab technicians that were working very hard during the summer and fall time. Um, and all of the eggs and um, parasitoids were counted and identified. And this was put into our data sheet. And so returning back to our key questions, we were able to identify habitats, plant features and plant species that help to um, support our parasitic wasps. And this will lead us to research-based recommendations to best support biological control of BMSB and potentially other insect pests as well. And so returning to one of my main objectives for my research, which is to elucidate which factors are important to a parasitoid discovering an insect egg, and also to the actual parasitism rate. Now, what does this mean? So we have our parasitoid, this is Anastasis reduvi. She comes along and she finds an insect egg host. The way we were able to denote that she dis at least discovered that insect egg host or egg unit as we call it, is that we had at least one parasitoid emerge from that insect egg unit. And so we say that that was discovered. She goes along, maybe she parasitizes some more, and that will equate to the parasitism rate. So the number of total number of emerged parasitoids um, over the total number of eggs there were. And this is how we calculated parasitism rate. And so with this, we have our um, response of egg unit discovery and parasitism rate, we were able to look at different factors and how it impacted the ability of a parasitoid to um, find an egg mass and the ability for her to um, really utilize that egg mass and have parasitism over it. So we looked at host egg identity, host egg feeding guild, host egg, um, host plant identity, and even host plant origin. And with this, we were able to run statistical analyses through the statistical program of R and R Studio. And we were looking at the factors of host egg and host plant identity. We used general linear mixed effect models, really long word. And for host egg feeding guild and host plant origin, we use generalized linear models. And so as I get into the nitty gritty of the results and the research, I'm mainly going to focus on the big picture conclusion that we got from the results. So I'm going to be putting up some graphs and some data. Some of us might be interested in that. And if you have questions, I can answer them after or even by email. But um, don't worry, we're just going to focus on big picture items here as we get into our results. So we're going to take a look at summary of what was collected first. So plants searched, collected eggs, and the parasitoids that we were able to wear out. So we were able to search 128 plant taxon groups and 52 plant taxon groups had at least one parasitoid of interest to our study emerge. This is combining both the 2020 and 2021 methods of our research. So that tree nursery study and the egg survey study with the community science project. We collected 949 egg units. Um, this equated to over 27,000 individual eggs and 141 mantid umutheca. If we've ever seen a mantis egg sac, it uh, looks like a paper mache um, glob. Um, so we call that a particular egg unit. And our egg unit would either be um, a single egg mass if that particular insect species only lays their eggs singly, 
versus um, an egg mass where we had uh, insect species that lay their eggs in clustered. So if it was found singly, then we call that an egg unit. If it was found in a cluster, then we also call that an egg unit. And we collected from 44 different insect taxon groups. And so getting into our results of what parasitoids we were able to rear out of these eggs in those growth chambers. And so with our table here on our top left column, we have the parasitoid species names. We have total number of parasitoids, the parasitoid taxon group, so typically a genus grouping, and then the total number of parasitoids for that group. So to draw our attention to our anastatus, remember, our key star parasitoid we want to learn more about is Anastatus reduvii, and they made up a big portion of all the different Anastatus that we collected. So a lot of Anastatus reduvii out in our ecosystems within Maryland, which is great. And then out of our Trisulcus, um, we had a majority of native Trisulcus, which is awesome. So our, our non-native species was Trisulcus japonicus, that samurai wasp that was accidentally introduced to the U.S., similar to BMSB. But the good news is, is we mainly collected our native Trisulcus species. And so in total, we had 2,692 parasitoids that we reared out and identified. So now we'll move on to what we learned about host eggs, particularly alternate egg hosts. When we're talking about alternate, we're talking about hosts other than BMSB because we know that Anastatus reduvii, that star parasitoid, is a generalist, parasitizes more than just stink bug eggs. We wanted to know what um, Anastatus reduvii is using for in-season spring and summer hosts as well as the overwintering hosts. We wanted to know parasitoid comp composition of BMSB versus Euschistus. We'll talk about that in a second. And effect of egg identity on parasitism rate. So here we have a table of overwintering egg hosts. Uh, along the top, we have first our egg order, family, and genus. So these are just different groupings of our particular insects, um, down to species and then common names. So we had wheelbug eggs, Carolina mantis, Chinese mantis, and bush cricket species. So out of all of the insect eggs we collected, these were the particular groups that are known to overwinter in the egg stage. Now, what did we have emerge from these overwintering eggs? Well, we can see that um, Anastatus utilizes both wheelbug and Carolina mantids as overwintering hosts. When we look at our green highlighted column here, Anastatus reduvii, that key species, we can see that it's also using wheelbug and Carolina mantids to overwinter in. Now, what's really interesting is when we're talking about origin. So we can talk about native versus non-native plants. We can also talk about native versus non-native insects. So we have the native Carolina mantis and we have the non-native Chinese mantis. And what was interesting is we did not find any BMSB or stink bug parasitoids emerging from our non-native Chinese mantis. What was really cool is we discovered a new host for Anastatus reduvii as Carolina mantis. So newly recorded and discovered for this particular species. Now we're taking a look at in-season egg hosts. So what is uh, what are our different parasitoids using for spring and summer to reproduce? So what insects in their eggs? And we can see a big list here of all these different insects um, same categories, we have it from order, family, genus, species to common name. Um, and we can take a look at our different parasitoid groups along the top here. We kept these to taxon group or particularly um, genus down to our non-native Trisulcus japonicus. And with our first column, we have Anastatus species. So that includes Anastatus reduvii. And we can see that this um, group of parasitoids utilizes all different types of insect species as in-season hosts. So a big variety. And then focusing in on our non-native Trisulcus japonicus, they're using a native and a non-native stink bug um, as an in-season host. 
What's super exciting is we were able to identify several new hosts, um, new records for anastatus. So learning more about hosts, learning more about its ecology, which is really cool. What was really interesting is our most um, common stink bug eggs that we were collected were both from BMSB, our key pest, and Eushistus. So Eushistus is a native brown stink bug. And we wanted to look at what was emerging from these eggs, um, comparing the composition of our different parasitoids. And what was interesting is we found that evolutionary relationships can be important. Now, what does this mean? So we'll pull up here that the big part of our parasitoids that emerged from our non-native BMSB was the non-native parasitoid. So that isn't surprising. And then we move over to our native brown stink bug. Um, the big section of our parasitoids was native parasitoids, including our native trisulcus and our native anastatus. So we can see evolutionary relationships matter where our non-native species tend to have a stronger relationship both have the same origin versus our native species having a stronger relationship. So we're gonna look at several graphs like this. These came from our general linear mixed effect models in R, so statistical analyses. We ran these models um, and we took a look at parasitism rate as our outcome. And we only looked at parasitism rate for egg units that were discovered. So we had at least one parasitoid emerge. And so we're gonna mainly look at the big picture results that we looked at, we got from these models. And so for this first one, we're looking at um, the impact of the insect eggs order on the parasitism rate by anastatus, so our key parasitoid. We found a higher predicted parasitism rate for Lepidoptera eggs, and that means our moths and our butterflies. And we found anastatus only parasitized um, Lepidopterans that belong to the family Saturnidae, our silk moths, which was interesting. So higher parasitism rate for our silk moths versus our sink bug eggs. So we took a look at the host egg. Now we're gonna take a look at the host plant. Um, being in the native plant society, hopefully some exciting results from here. So these are host plant parasitoid associations. Um, and so we can see in our table on the top, the parasitoid taxon group, we have our main um, stink bug parasitoid groups shown here, and the number of plant taxon groups they were associated with or they were found on. And so we can see that um, these particular plant species along the bottom here listed out had four more parasitoid taxon groups. So we can infer that these particular plant species um, support a good amount of our stink bug parasitoids, including red maples, sugar maples, eastern redbud, white oak, and scarlet oak. With this particular model, we were looking at the effect of tree genus on parasitism rate of pooling all of our stink bug parasitoids together, including our anastatus and anastatus reduvii. We found a higher predicted parasitism rate for eggs that were laid on corcus or oak in comparison to acer or maple. And then we found significant differences between our tree species as well. We found significant differences between tree species. When we just looked at the parasitism rate by anastatus, we did not see a significant difference between Acer versus Quercus, um, just looking at that genus. And then pooling all of our parasitoid species together, we saw significant differences between tree species and predicted parasitism rate. So, showing us that it matters what um, tree species an egg is laid on in relation to um, the parasitism rate. And then what was very cool is we ran this interaction model. So we wanted to combine two different factors. We wanted to combine uh, the tree genus 
and then the identity of the insect egg unit to see if that would matter. And we found a significant relationship um, when we looked at our BMSB eggs. So when the BMSB eggs are laid on Acer versus Quercus, we found that the eggs laid on Quercus had a higher predicted parasitism rate. So a higher um, predicted chance of them being parasitized. So go Oaks. Um, we found from this research that Oaks could be a great host to support biological control of BMSB and potentially other insect pests. Last but not least, we looked at plant origin. And this had a really interesting story. And for sake of time, I don't have all of the results that had to do with plant origin. But what was interesting is we found a higher predicted parasitism rate for eggs that were laid on non-native plants. As I'll say in the conclusions later, we had a higher chance of an egg unit being discovered on native plants. So higher parasitism rate for some reason on our non-native plants. We'll take a look at habitat as our last factor in looking at parasitoid composition. So where are these different parasitoids being found um, in relation to the different habitat types that we searched? And we'll start with Anastatus, our key parasitoid. And luckily it's being found in various different habitats, including tree nurseries, urban settings, including urban woody settings, and even natural woods and wooded edges. And then with our other parasitoids, we can see that Oon certus, for some reason, is found a lot within our agricultural systems. This tends to be because one of their main hosts is harlequin bug, which is found on a lot of our produce um, crops. Um, and then with our native Trisulcus japonicus, found in various settings, including tree nurseries as well, urban herbaceous, urban vegetable gardens, um, our non-native Trisulcus japonicus, generally found within our tree nurseries. And then um, our other group, Telenomus, found within tree nurseries and urban herbaceous settings, as well as urban woody settings. So the, the main key message that I got from this is that we are luckily finding parasitoids within our urban settings, um, which is great news to hear. So they're not only found in our natural um, left alone type of areas, but also within our managed systems, we're still finding these key natural enemies. So what are some conclusions from all of these results? Well, our star parasitoid, we learned Anastasis rodivii is utilizing eggs of assassin bugs and Carolina mantids as overwintering hosts. Hmm, that's interesting because both our Anastasis, both our assassin bugs and our Carolina mantids are natural enemies themselves. They're predators out in our landscapes. And so Anastasis reduvii appears to be imposing what's called intraguild parasitism. So it's within the guild of being a natural enemy um, with our mantid, our assassin bug, and our parasitoid, and they tend to be attacking each other. So we call that intraguild parasitism with our generalist predators like our assassin bugs and mantids. And so they're all attacking our BMSB and they're attacking each other, which is quite an interesting relationship. Anastatus species utilize several different insect species across orders as in-season hosts, including hemipterans, which is our true bugs, and lepidopterans, which is our moths, butterflies, and skippers. Further conclusions, egg identity, so the identity of our insect eggs, the plant identity and plant origin all seem to affect parasitism rate, and our findings allow us to implement more effective biological control programs. Host tree impacts parasitism rate of sink bug eggs with highest parasitism rate of BMSB on our oak trees. So when BMSB eggs, eggs are laid on our oaks, we have higher biological control. Native plants had higher discovery efficiency, so our parasitoids tended to find more of our egg units on our native plants. And then our non-native plants, interestingly, supported higher parasitism rates. And this is likely driven by Anastatus, who's a generalist, not picky about the eggs they're finding. And so maybe a lot of Anastatus' hosts uh, tend to prefer our non-native plants for some reason. Urban settings can support BMSB-related parasitoids. Great news with climate change. 
Um, of course, with things progressing, our parasitoids will need our help to continue to support them to stay within our urban environments. And so what does this mean for biological control? Quercus, Acer, and Circus, so oak, maple, and redbud trees, could be planted to support biological control of stink bugs and possibly other insect pests by egg parasitoids. Consider planting tree species that support non-outbreaking host egg species, alternate hosts. So this plays into the concept of, of we don't want to eliminate our pests, we just want to lower their populations below damaging levels because these pests or herbivorous insects are food for our beneficial insects like our natural enemies. So if we want to maintain natural enemies within our environment to have that sustainable pest control, we need to provide them with food, which means um, tolerating some level of pests or herbivorous insects within our landscapes. Caution should be used until more is known about anisatis and its use of other predators as overwintering hosts, especially for augmentative biological control. So this means before we start rearing a bunch of these anisatis and releasing them in high numbers in our environments, we want to learn more about this interesting relationship where it's attacking or parasitizing other predators in our landscapes. So more research is needed here. So to break it all down, to give you some take home points um, from today's presentation, um, returning to our title of today's talk, how does plant selection uh, impact sustainable pest control? So our example here, we have our different trophic levels, starting with our example of an oak tree and its oak leaf with our Next trophic level are our herbivorous uh, animal or pests of our stink bug. And then above that, what we learned is about our, our parasitoid, our natural enemy. And so we found that it matters what plant um, the insect egg is laid on. And we, I didn't delve into the mechanisms behind this. More research is done, but we can hypothesize that it could have to do with coevolutionary relationships. Um, what that plant also does for our parasitoid as well. We know that our parasitoids need sources of nectar. They need refuges and habitats, um, places to hide from their predators. Um, so this could mean it matters the relationship directly between the parasitoid and the plant itself. So what plants we add to our landscape influences what herbivorous insects are on them, which influences what predators are coming into our landscapes as well. Another classic example is uh, wanting caterpillars within our systems to be able to feed our native birds. And that all stems from what plants we choose to add to our landscape. And other than simply plant choice, what research has also shown is plant structural and species diversity is very important. So we have our key example here on our left, a lot of people's lawns or landscapes tend to look very monoculture. We have a lot of lawn, um, just a couple different species of plants, um, not a lot of diversity here. But when we move to landscapes that have more structural diversity, so diversity within 3D space, uh, we have some shrubs, ground covers, trees, floraling plants. This adds a diversity of different refuges, microclimates, and alternate food sources so we can support biodiversity within our landscapes. And we tend to find uh, through research that when we increase plant structural and species diversity, we um, encourage more of these pollinator insects and natural enemy insects, and they create a more balanced system. So when we're attracting more of our natural enemies, they're providing us with sustainable pest control and lowering our pest populations. Versus the landscape on our left, we might have a lot of pests, but we might not have uh, the refuges, the resources to support natural enemies to come in and to lower those pest populations for us.
And these are some photos that I took. The only one I didn't take that I need to find a good example of is our crab spider on our bottom um, by Kay Harvey. But I wanted to show um, all these different micro, uh, refuges and microhabitats that these insects hide out in. And it goes to show the importance of adding diversity within our landscapes. Uh, we can see some parasitic wasps here using floral resources like our mountain mint. Uh, we see predators like our ladybird beetle in both its larval and adult stage within our flowers looking for uh, food other than other insects such as seed and pollen. We have uh, mantid egg cases. So this is an example up here on our right of our Chinese mantis hiding within some sort of woody shrub. We have this really cool picture of a spider, great predators within our landscapes, um, hiding out on this grass blade right on to our right. And then on our left, we have a wheel bug. So that insect that our parasitoids we found Anastatus is using as an overwintering host. You might see these out in your landscape this winter. Um, they tend to be about the size of a quarter. And so this is the wheel bug egg mass. And so this is in the spring slash summertime when the baby wheel bugs have hatched out. And so these are the nymphs of the wheel bugs. Great predator to see. So in summary, what can you do to support biological control, to support our natural enemies, including our parasitic wasps? The top thing you can do is to reduce pesticide use. Um, and this can include mosquito sprays that have become really popular um, or mosquito, mosquito fogs. Um, the, the chemicals they tend to use have been shown to um, harm a lot of our beneficial insects. We can increase plant structural and species diversity, and we can provide a diversity of floral resources. So good news is, is our pollinator gardens are not only supporting our pollinating insects, but also our natural enemies as well. So with that, I have two slides of resources for you all. And if anyone wants a PDF copy of today's presentation, or at least the resources, I'd be happy to share them with you. There are a lot of really great guides out there on ways to design our landscapes to support beneficial insects. So a couple of these guides are listed here. Also some really great plant lists out there that you all may already be aware of. One of my favorite sites to look for um, a plant list to support beneficial insects include the Xerces Society. And if you are looking for ways to identify plants or at least to help you along the way of learning your plants, if you don't already, um, you can check out sites like iNaturalist or if you have a smartphone, you can use apps like Google Lens or iNaturalist Seek app. And this is a great place to start. It doesn't always get the identification right, um, but can lead you on the, along the path of identification. I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge my funding sources for my master's research. Um, that includes the Maryland Native Plant Society um, where I was awarded the one of the 2021 research grants. I wanna acknowledge the members of my research lab, uh, my master's committee, as well as other colleagues, the tree nursery that we conducted part of the research in, and the 50 Maryland Master Gardeners that helped me collect all the wonderful data to support my research. And with that, I would like to thank you all for tuning in tonight, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Maddie. That was really, really fun to to listen to and learn about what you've been doing. So there are some questions in the chat. First question was uh, about kind of growing parasitic wasps and uh, you know how 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 to do that essentially. Yeah, that's a great question. So we did have to do this for um, earlier research that I did. Um, where I actually was learning more about that non-native Trisulcus japonicus known as samurai wasp. We reared uh, parasitoid colonies. Um, I wish I could put up some pictures. Uh, we, 
used an interesting like to go container that I like cut out little windows and put mesh in. So lots of arts and crafts involved with research at the time. But we had to basically have an entire colony of stink bugs in order to support and rear the parasitoid colony. So it was a lot of work. Um, we had a lot of research technicians helping us, but we basically had like a giant growth chamber with these stink bugs that we were rearing. We were collecting their eggs, rearing the nymph, the baby stink bugs. And then with those eggs, um, some of them we took fresh and then we'd introduce them um, into enclosed environments to the parasitoids, waited till those parasitoids developed and emerged and then added them to our colony. Um, so pretty interesting. I could probably talk about that for a while. It involved aspirators, if you know what that is, to move parasitoids around. A lot of trial and error, but it was an interesting project to start my um, research journey on, I should, I should say. Patty McGrath. Thank you. Um, it looks like the egg masses that you gathered were on leaves. And I saw some egg masses on in the crevices of the bark of the locust tree where I put my suet cage. And I wasn't about to leave them because I was afraid that they were from, um, you know, lantern flies or some mm -hmm. kind of invasive thing. And I thought, oh God, no, because there were a lot of eggs. There right, were right. blotches in all different places. Although the woodpeckers who come to take the suet hopefully would have taken care of them, but I don't know. So did I do a bad thing? Well, you're right. Uh, there is definitely insect eggs, um, both on herbaceous material and on bark. So it could be on the trunk or branches. Um, and we did, I created a training video because this community science project ran right during COVID. Um, so we did train our community scientists to look in all these different places for insect eggs. Um, and we gave them a little scraper to scrape off egg masses that were found on bark. So we got them from all different areas like you found on the bark. Mm -hmm. I would just say, and I say this for any different stage of insect, it's always important to identify it before we consider it a pest. Insect eggs are especially tricky. Um, I don't think our apps or our smartphones are good enough to identify insect eggs quite yet, but I would highly encourage you if you find an unknown insect egg mass to snap a photo, a really clear photo and send it to UMD Ask Extension. And one of our extension oh. specialists could identify it for you. Now, and oh. related to spotted lanternfly, um, it is really important to um, educate yourself on what their egg masses look like. Uh, there's some great images online. It tends to be kind of a muddy um, egg mass along bark. Um, and you're probably going to be seeing those in your area in the wintertime if you're seeing adult spot lanternfly. And if you would like, you can scrape those off of bark and put them into soapy water. So definitely look up what those look like just so you're aware. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. This was so informative. This was great. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you, Patty. So uh, that's actually a great segue to another question, um, which uh, B. Siegel asked, should we destroy stink bug eggs, assuming that you can identify them, uh, or leave them in case they contain parasitoids? I would leave them um, unless they are on a highly prized um, vegetable or produce plant. Now, the key thing here is that for us, we're not selling our produce typically. Um, so a little bruising isn't going to make them inedible. Um, the main damage that they were causing to a lot of our produce and our agricultural systems was making them unmarketable because they looked weird. You know, like if someone saw a tomato with that bruising or cat facing, um, they might not buy it. So a particular produce that has a little bit of that stink bug damage, we can still eat it. It's perfectly safe. Um, so it's up to you. I would I would prefer removing the adult stink bugs if you see them feeding on your plant, because like you said, those stink bug egg masses might have some valuable parasitoids that are going to emerge out. Mark, you had a question? Yeah, what, are, what are the natural places that where brown marmot may eat a stink bug is, is the worst, and then these are the places we need to release the parasitoids? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, they tend to... Uh, depends on the type time of year. Um, they typically seek out high ground um, to overwinter. So they'll go toward high, higher elevations um, and then they'll 
their natural habitat is to seek out bark, um, hiding underneath bark, but they tend to find human-made structures like buildings to overwinter in. So they reach sort of an overwintering diapause stage where they slow their metabolism down, they're not mating anymore, and they stay an adult through the winter time, slow down, and then spring they'll emerge out. Um, so if they're in that woodland setting, not in human-made structures, they're going to move into um, crops if they're in an agricultural area um, or any sort of produce or host plant, which we saw could be over 200 different host plants. And so they'll move into more of a produce agricultural area to begin to feed. So we could either target them when they're in that woodland setting, which is good news because a lot of our parasitoids prefer arboreal habitats, or we could target them when they're in our produce. Um, and there are specific parasitoids that tend to be in our agricultural settings, as we saw with our own Certus group of parasitoids. So the natural places want to protect are wooded habitats that are edgewood habitats or deep in the woods? Edgewood habitats. Yep, you're right about that. So let's plan on doing that, right? So yeah, there's still research being done. Um, as we found, there has been uh, natural things that have caused BMSB populations to decrease, which is good news. But um, there is models that have come out with climate change that we could have a resurgence of BMSB and their range could expand up into Canada. So Canada might have um, some bad news coming for them, especially their agricultural system. So it's still good to learn more about ways to sustainably control this pest. And does it help to have the modern kind of agriculture called agroecology, where you have uh, cover crops and all that stuff? I'm sure it does help. Um, Typically, that also means using less harmful pesticides, which would support our parasitoid populations. Yeah, I only, I only use pesticides to cut stump, uh, like English ivy vines that are two inches in diameter and so forth that can't be dug out. Just a small amount at the, at the cut stump, that's it. Right, yeah, our herbicides, yep, that makes sense. Maddie, you had mentioned predators in uh, part of that answer. Um, and Patty had another question in the chat. Uh, do native stink bugs serve as food for birds or I suppose any other types of animals? Yes, they can. Um, and luckily a lot of our um, predatory birds and mammals uh, have learned to feed on BMSB. Um, one of my colleagues has a great collage of all the different animals, spiders feeding on BMSB. So we're all hoping that the same thing happens for spotted lanternfly, where our native natural predators learn to feed on spotted lanternfly. It could take some time as this is a new um, prey item for them, might seem unusual, um, but maybe once they learn it's safe to eat, they could help to lower their populations as well. And that's actually a great uh, segue to another question. Uh, Dave Fearon was asking, do you know any predators that do target the spotted lanternfly? Uh, they have found that uh, some of our uh, or web spiders uh, feed on spotted lanternfly, um, which is interesting, especially because some of these or web spiders come from the same region um, of Asia as spotted lanternfly. So there's potentially a co-evolutionary relationship there. Um, still learning more and more about spotted lanternfly. I would just say the good news is, is there hasn't been evidence that spotted lanternfly um, feeding is related to plant mortality. So for us, if we're not um, growing grapes or hops, it isn't a huge concern. Um, it's more of a nuisance pest, especially because spotted lanternfly is um, a sap feeder, has that piercing sucking mouth part, just like our stink bugs, and its byproduct is honeydew, very sticky. And so if we found a huge amount of spotted lanternflies, we're probably going to see a huge amount of honeydew, can be sticky, can be annoying, and sometimes on that honeydew, sooty mold can grow, which is a dark mold. Um, so more of a nuisance than anything, um, which is the good news. Brent, uh, you are raising your hand. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, do we know enough about their life cycle to understand the dynamics of mating where, you know, the males emerge earlier? Do they need anything special relative to 
the females um, and do eggs that are parasitized have a diff uh, like do they have a different appearance from non-parasitized eggs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, with the parasitized egg masses, they tend to be darker in color. Um, typically, if they aren't parasitized, they'll begin to turn white or clear or stay their original color when we're talking about BMSB, that green minty color. If they're parasitized, generally they're going to look dark gray or black is a good indication that they're parasitized. So that's a cool thing to look out for in your landscapes um, if you find a stink bug egg mass or even another type of insect egg mass. Um, in relation to uh, male versus female, um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head targeting um, that different stages. Um, a lot of the biological control research has been on these parasitic wasps that attack the egg stage. So really important to know when they're laying their eggs each year, which could evolve over time with climate change. So something to um, continue to study and look into. Lauren, did you have a question? So I'm going back to your some of your findings, I think I understood, and I could have had this wrong, but that you did not find as much, I think, parasitoids in the urban herbaceous setting. Is that a correct view? Yes. Oh, at least of the of the of the anastatus species. Right, right. Okay. Um, and I'm I'm just wondering about that and thinking about, well, so the high numbers that you saw are seem to be correlated with the, the oaks, which sort of makes sense to me because oaks support so many other species of insect and so on. I kind of figure that might be, I'm guessing, but you know, I figure that makes some sense. And I'm wondering when you collected this data, did people indicate what exact species of plant they were collecting from because so frequently in an urban herbaceous landscape, it's mostly non-native species. That's what I'm kind of getting at. So like, if you looked at a whole bunch of goldenrods, for example, which are, are lean on the higher, you know, insect um, host as, as far as like Doug Ptolemy's research, so maybe just Lapidoptera, do you, would that make any difference? You know, would having a more native, rich, herbaceous layer make a difference? Mm -hmm. That is a great question. Um, I would have to look, go back to look at my data, um, breaking up the origin of the herbaceous plants. Um, off the top of my head, I, I would probably guess that a lot of our herbaceous plants were non-native. Um, my guess for why we saw less anastatus in our herbaceous layers, we already knew from pre previous research that it tends to prefer arboreal habitats. Um, so um, we would have to look at, I'll, I did my best to look at GPS coordinates and Google Maps to see if any of our herbaceous plants were with around trees or not. Um, but it goes to show that if we were to add more trees within our urban systems that um, tracked the parasitoids because these particular native trees would have their hosts and then maybe they would be able to spread onto our herbaceous materials and our um, produce plants to control our stink bugs. Um, so all about kind of building our ecosystems because um, it's all interconnected when we have our green spaces. Um, hopefully having less habitat fragmentation over time. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Joe Francis asks whether you've published these findings yet. Great question. Um, we have been approved for our first short publication. A lot of it was on new host records. And so that will be coming out soon in the Journal of Biological Control, which is super exciting. Um, we are working on a bigger publication for a lot of these results. My master's thesis will be published this May, May of 2024. So you can find that online with um, a lot of these results as well. I just want to give a, a very big thank you to Maddie. An excellent presentation. I think we all enjoyed it and we all learned a lot. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope you learned something new and you're welcome to reach out to me by my email if you have any follow-up questions.